worked. I wanted to work part time in order to be able to save my best energy for my kids as well as my patients. I had the audacity to think that maybe there was a better solution, but I knew that I would have to create it myself. In other words, have my own practice. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel or welcome to the channel if you're new here. I am delighted to have with us today, Dr. Mitra Sadhu. She is a nephrologist, a mom. She is a change agent and a vocal champion for lean practice, which we are going to be talking about today. But before we do, Mitra, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me here, Dr. Eggert. Um, it's truly a pleasure. Yeah. And for people who have not yet had the opportunity to meet you, can you share a little bit more about your story and what brought you into being such a strong advocate for the lean practice? Sure thing. Um, so I was born and raised in India, did my med school there and moved uh, to the United States when I got married, uh, did the rest of my training in um, Miami, at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. And uh, uh, right after training, had my babies and spent some time at home with them. So right about then, right at the outset, I realized that I wanted to work part time in order to be able to save my best energy for my kids as well as my patients. And uh, when I looked at opportunities that others were affording me, I quickly realized that that was going to be hard uh, to feel the satisfaction that I wanted to get from work, take care of patients exactly the way I wanted to, as well as be there on a day-to-day -day basis and be the primary parent for my children. Um, so that is what led to a series of events. And here I am. And it's so fascinating because a lot of times coming straight off of residency, Many of us, you know, especially because culture is saying like, oh yeah, women, they shift out of, you know, full-time practice within six years, they might consider leaving. Right. And so many of us develop this mindset of, oh, well, I'm going to prove them wrong. Instead of listening and being in tune with our values, we get more self-critical and judgmental about even considering the option of, I'm going to intentionally look for a job that fits what I'm seeking from a value standpoint of spending more time with family, of more time with patients. And can you tell us what was going on in your head if there was anything that was judging or were you self-accepting of that uh, concept right from the beginning? Sure. So for some reason, I've never compared um, myself to others or um, or you know, I think I should point out here that I've never been the primary breadwinner. I think that is a huge um, privilege that has afforded me the at least the financial flexibility. Of course, the mindset part is definitely important. And um, I don't know, I've always had the strong pull to uh, be there for the children. Um, maybe again, because my husband is so busy, he's a physician as well. And I knew that it, I just didn't like the idea of both of us not being there. Um, so that was the driving um, uh, force. And um, so I, I've i never, one, been employed or two, worked uh, full-time uh, since training or since completing training. In the beginning, did I did some independent contractor gigs around town. So that afforded me the flexibility and let me work part-time. Uh, in a few years, I wanted to do a little bit more. Uh, and so I interviewed with some groups in town um, uh, and uh, quickly figured out that there were uh, overall two um, basic routes that I could choose from. I could either work part time for them and stay an employee and work what is uh, called mommy hours and not as a compliment uh, and also get paid um, a heavily discounted amount for that privilege. Um, also not be able to grow just to stay that way or um, work a hundred hours a week at the partnership track uh, and everything else that comes with it, including more hundred hour weeks. So um, neither of these two really fit. I had the audacity to think that maybe there was a better solution, but I knew that I would have to create it myself. In other words, have my own practice. And that is when the wheel started turning. I was like, how can I have a practice that lets me do the things that I wanted to do um, and uh, still keep the lights on? And it wasn't very um, premeditated, the word lean, or I didn't even know much of this at, uh, at that time. 
I just did some back of the napkin calculations and figured out that the two biggest expenses for any practice really, just not just a small practice, is office space and personal. So if I could cut back uh, um, the expenses on those two, then maybe I could make this work. Um, and that's what I did. I uh, work out of a shared workspace and my rent is really low. I also started like a pay as you go kind of thing. Um, I remember the first time I had one patient. I um, For that week, I rented it out for one hour. And so I was net wow. positive from the first patient on. Hmm. If you exclude uh, startup costs, and I bootstrapped the startup costs quite a bit too. Um, so, uh, right, so that can be done. And secondly, on the personal side, on the staff side, I started as a micro practice. It's not very usual to do that in an insurance based uh, model. I know that in the DPC world, it is pretty common. People start as micro practices all the time. I am really grateful I did because it helped me learn everything A to Z that a practice involves. And that's really important. Because um, doctors sometimes feel that they don't need to know all of the business. Mm -hmm. They're physicians and they are best served by working to the top, uh, you know, working, doing the physician only jobs. And that's cool. That's great. Uh, once you are well established uh, or um, but when uh, you don't have better use for your time or at the very beginning, at the end of the day, uh, you are a physician and also a business owner as a private practice uh, owner. So you do need to know every single aspect of the business so you can optimize it. Um, so, yeah, I used to pick up the phone and do my own billing and uh, room mm -hmm. my patients and all of it. Uh, still do much of it. But I did buy back my time uh, by hiring a virtual assistant when my volume was um, enough that I was spending uh, evenings and weekends on these tasks. And I didn't want to do that. Mm. Yeah. And it's fascinating to think about because one, I'll just go back to what you said about the model of rent, right? I didn't even know that was pay as you go kind of thing. I didn't even know that was an option. So for anyone listening, like exploring options, you may not be aware of, right? Because we would think, oh, well, I have to invest in this year to five year contract because I have to. Right. How can you get creative and explore what's possible in order to set you up so that your overhead, I come from a background initially as a dentist and our overhead would have been super, super yes. high, super high. And so overhead always worries me. I'm in Houston right now and we just had a hurricane that shut down people's offices. And I'm just thinking about, okay, when you're not able to practice, you're still having to pay the overhead. So if you can reduce the overhead by getting creative like you did, that is amazing. So thank you for sharing that and even just offering people to get their wheels turning and that, you know, now shared office space and it's such a beautiful community here in Houston where physicians were sharing their office space for people whose power wasn't on uh, yet. And so how can we develop collaborative relationships where you're working with each other? I think medicine often gets competitive and like, how can you have a community around you? And then where people are like, I don't want to learn all this admin, right? We're hearing burnout. I'm like, oh, I left, you know, people are wanting to leave the systems because they don't want to do the admin stuff. And here, you know, you started and, and you were the jack of all trades in the beginning. Can you share how that was for you? Sure. So um, I enjoy the business aspects, uh, I'll have to say. And yes, it is not everybody's cup of tea, but these are learnable skills. Like Brian Tracy says, all business skills are learnable. Mm -hmm. And compared to what we physicians do in our day jobs, the, the physicianing part of it, these things are so easy. So I think wonder if it is a bit of a mental block that we yeah. are not good at it or that we don't want to do it or that these are a pain. They're not so bad. Yes, they're tedious, but um, uh, 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 that's the thing. You build it up, up to a level where you come to a point where you can outsource it, then please outsource it. I don't mow my own lawn uh, because I can afford to, but um, uh, you know, uh, similarly. So uh, again, it is also not about being a penny wise and pound foolish. So don't keep these doing, keep doing these things if you have better use for your time and if you could make more uh, and serve people better by um, uh, seeing more patients and outsourcing these. Um, but um, uh, I like to think of it like, um, say an electrician or a landscaper, when he, if they're deciding to start their own uh, little company, uh, they would never dream of outsourcing things right at the get-go. 
because they know that at the end of the day, their business is their baby and they're responsible for it. Its success and its failure is fully dependent on it. And um, I used to say my uh, that line to myself a lot. Um, I am fully 100% responsible whether this is going to succeed or fail. That maybe helped with uh, doing some of these things when I did not feel like doing them. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I uh, always liked about this and still do is it lets me do them from home. Um, so I can do them and when my kid is across uh, from me at the kitchen table doing her homework. Uh, but I'm home. I'm present. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, I'm uh, cooking on the side as well. So um, it lets me be there for my family the way I want to do as I'm doing some billing and some patient, posting some patient uh, payments uh, or answering messages and all of that. So I really did not mind it. For anybody wondering uh, if it's hard, it is not. It is so doable. Mm, so it just seems like the anticipation of it being hard is the hardest part to overcome. Beautifully said. Yes. <laughs> and you did finance. You do finance blogs, and you had supporting physicians with the finance mindset. And I just wanted to capture and kind of tr- relate that back to in 2020, 2021, when the world was exploding. Um, and everything was getting shut down. I had, you know, uh, I would, had always had this goal of learning finance, like the stock market and investment. And it was always this mental block, some intimidation. And so I just, you know, I temporarily hired a, a financial advisor, but I didn't know enough to, to know how to really screen. And I just felt something was, I'm, I'm a little bit controlling with finances. I've had family members that definitely got taken advantage of. And so I'm you know, very uh, paranoid, right? Especially when positions get preyed on, people that are perceived to be high income can really be at risk. And um, unfortunately we hear about embezzlement and we hear about you know when maybe this, the personnel you hire to help isn't as good as you could be. So where I was going with that is I learned finances enough where I could do it myself and also observe the red flags. The financial advisor was putting me into higher stocks with higher expense ratios. Like there's no rhyme or reason I could find the same stock, lower expense ratio. Like was not hard to figure out this lingo and understand like why that was not the best for me and just take all my money back and be able to just simplify. So if we could simplify, this is a you know lean private practice. Like if we can even just simplify, do the basics, get the basics down. Therefore, when you hire somebody, you can help them make sure like they're doing the right, you know, the thing appropriately exactly. for you, right? Yes. And maybe they'll teach you yes. something, but maybe they won't be as experienced. And then if you lose that personnel, you're not so dependent on them, right? Because you have the basic yes. skills. Yes. Hundred percent, all of it. Yes, um, and I love the analogy with personal finance. That is absolutely true. Um, you need to know how to vet how your employee is doing and whether they're doing things right. And you know, generally, uh, I found a lot of the processes in medicine are unnecessarily complicated. Uh, there is redundancy. There is waste, which mm-hmm. was all okay up to a decade back because there was enough to go around. You could have waste and you could still make enough profit that everybody is happy. It's not the same anymore. The cost of business is rising and reimbursements are falling uh, for those of us still in the insurance model. And so <clears throat> reducing waste is uh, paramount. There's only so much you can keep increasing volume and you're always doing that at the cost of more work uh, for yourself and staff um, uh, uh, or decreasing time from patients, all of the things that more volume brings with it. Um, So again, just like they say in personal finance, no matter how much you make, if you keep spending, then you will never feel rich. Uh, You always have to tame down uh, spending in order to feel like you have enough. It's the same. It's the same for the business. It's just uh, the math's got to math. The money scarcity too, right? That could be real. But it also just, if we have this mindset that we're reducing redundancy, we're reducing waste, that could actually be translated into physicians not feeling they have enough time. And and to say, well, where else are you being redundant? Usually it's notes. I was really redundant. I would not want to be on the computer for patients. So I would write it all down and then type it all later at night. It was so redundant and never you know, because our computers were behind the patient. So it was Mm. so rude. Like there was no Mm. way that I, I mean, there was a way, there was a way I could have had a a laptop, right? There was a way I just didn't utilize it. And I, you know, realized that it was the expense of my own time. So if you're thinking about redundancy from a, it's like this whole 
like we were talking about mindset. It's like, I'm going to look at redundancy in my business. I'm going to look at where I'm being redundant in my life, because if your values are to get more time back, to spend more time with the patients, to spend more time with your family, to spend less time giving yourself, giving free services to your institution or doing free labor and not getting reimbursed, you know, so just like, it's such a <clears throat> applicable type of message for many different facets of life. A hundred percent. You know, I am smiling because what you did and what you said was uh, the very definition of lean. So uh, lean innovation actually comes from manufacturing. Um, it was not born in healthcare. In fact, healthcare has been slow in adopting it compared to other um, industries like healthcare is in general. Lean is defined as a way of thinking of providing perfect value with zero waste or providing the best value you can while minimizing waste. It is not synonymous with cost cutting. Costs come down because your processes are streamlined and uh, there is less waste and your employees are happy and all of that. If you are laser focused on the value you provide to patients, and it, you can think about all the values you provide, you know, one is taking excellent clinical care of them. You're probably already doing that. It's the other stuff, uh, phone calls, getting questions answered between appointments, reaching a human on the phone, uh, getting an appointment within a reasonable time, whether it's a new patient or an established patient, and uh, streamlining and simplifying the uh, RCM process, the revenue cycle management, the billing aspect of things. So if you take each of these values that you provide to patients and then look at the processes that go within each of them, that process is called value stream mapping, and then uh, you sit down as a team um, and figure out where, uh, what could we cut back? What could we eliminate? What are the bottlenecks that we can unclog um, and make those, uh, test out those changes and come back, brainstorm and iterate. That's the process. And you keep at it and you keep at it because the, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you never get to the North Star of a perfect value with zero waste, but uh, that's your goal. And you do do that with every value in a process of continuous improvement. Uh, the Japanese actually have a word for it. It's called Kaizen because lean principles come from Toyota, the car manufacturer. Nice. Their, their leadership came up with a bunch of these bunch of these guiding principles and tested them over decades. And then finally, they published it in the Toyota production system. Um, and there, from there on, it went to other uh, manufacturers, other companies adopted it, and then went on to other industries. It's yeah, only in its infancy in healthcare, but I think it's perfect for healthcare. Here we are trying to meet an enormous demand and an ever-increasing demand with ever-shrinking resources. <clears throat> it, it fits. And this is such an attitude, right? It's, it's, <coughs> the, the word sustainability comes to my mind. If we reduce waste, if we think about it, so in 2020, uh, 2021 timeframe, I had a condo because American Dream told me I needed to buy a condo when I you know, was first attending. I thought I was going to be this institution that I went to forever as a high growth opportunity, closer to family, bought the condo, um, you know, decorated the condo, made it a home. And I felt the weight, the heavy weight. I had paid off my student loan. So of course, the next step, I'm going to get a mortgage, right? And just the heavy weight of that. And I ended up selling it and, and it wasn't huge economic this like great decision from a standpoint of, oh, you should hold on to a house for two years. I sold it in one, right? So like mentally, if I were to have tried to optimize my uh, income, I probably would have followed these rules. But psychologically, I sell this house. I sell most everything in it. I move half a mile down the street to an apartment and I was so much lighter, so much freer. That, I mean, I was also critically ill at the time. So selling everything was like, well, if I die, I don't want my family to. So there were some like factors that were catalytic that allowed me to do that quite easily. But what it taught me was that, you know, if physicians are, you know, trying to optimize their income and then their spending, because we're told we need to have a certain lifestyle. Well, like if you have sustainability in your mind and optimizing value, so you're having this lean pri private practice and then think about in your life, like what's actually adding joy to your life? What is feeling like it's heavy? Because right now my lifestyle and I have the privilege of being a single female with one dog. So I, I'm, I am the primary breadwinner, but my needs are low. Yeah. Um, so I will accept that, but it's just thinking, okay, well, I was really nervous because my career has been um, a lot of different transitions. So like on paper, it's really hard for, uh, 
me to sometimes conceptualize what job I want to take. And we talked a little bit about, I mean, I just transitioned from a job and I'm being very intentional about next steps. And the only way I've been able to put myself in a position to be intentional and take time is by reducing costs so that I'm not so worried about keeping up the lifestyle. And so that was kind of a long-winded way to just suggest that people audit their lifestyle and are they doing it because they think they need to look a certain way? They were sold that these materialistic things make you happy. And at what cost? Because if then you're going to have to work more in order to afford it, is it worth it to you or not? And so if you're thinking about sustainability in, pri in, in practice, sustainability when it comes to your wellness, you know, if we don't shift the narratives that we have to work a bazillion hours per week, well, is that sustainable? Do you really want to do that? sustainability in your personal life. Right, right. Very, very well put. Absolutely. So it's almost like for everything, there's a rule book, right? There's, uh, I don't know who wrote it. The adults in the room wrote it. Um, mm -hmm. how, uh, how we should uh, live, what kind of house and car we should have, how many hours we should work, and how we should practice. So it's, <clears throat> it's very much the same. It's like the world, maybe your family too, expects that you will live in a certain kind of neighborhood and do certain kind of things because right. you're a doctor. It's the same with patients and society at large, um, uh, and even and uh, us physicians as well. Uh, what the, uh, what we think a practice should look like, which uh, the, uh, how the office should look like, uh, how um, you shouldn't be coming and getting the patient from the waiting room, but there should be a receptionist sitting there. Even if um, you know uh, there is not that much uh, role for that person or uh, or any uh, any other staff. So yes, uh, that's why I think the redundancy comes from these expectations we have as to how um, um, how our practices need to look, just like how we think our personal lives uh, need to look. Uh, and I think um, there's been a movement recently and physicians are so much more aware on the personal finance side because uh, incomes have either stagnated or gone down and loans are at an all time high and stuff. But I, uh, I think the mindset, uh, the same mindset regarding practice is a little uh, uh, behind because uh, a lot of it is fear, uh, what patients will think and say, and whether that will uh, stop them from coming through the door. Um, mm -hmm. I um, I had a bunch of patients, in the, especially in the beginning, ask, uh, I mean, and you know, some of them were fairly deferential about it. They were like, hey, doc, if you don't mind, why are you in this space? What are you doing here? Um, <clears throat> and in the beginning, I used to be really... I used to be really uncomfortable about this question. I used to mumble something like I'm just starting out or something. And slowly and slowly, I realized that I was providing all the value that I could for a patient despite this, that I was not going to be able to do any better for a patient if I was in a fancier office or if I had staff hovering over me. And when I realized that, that's when I, I showed up to that question differently. I used to take a few seconds to maybe educate uh, patients. Um, and, you know, this is why I'm doing it. This is so that I can give more time to patients and I don't have to chase volume. Uh, it lets me work part-time um, as well. I'm not shy about any of these. Um, and now these aspects are all over my reviews and uh, stuff. So the questions have decreased. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, anytime they come, I welcome it. I'm like, yeah. Um, and so pa patients don't know the, uh, the inside story. It will be a process of mindset shift. Uh, and education for physicians, for patients, um, uh, for everybody. And what you just showcased there too, is like what comes up is our own internal dialogue and what we, you know, kind of our internal judgment and the way that you showcase this is like, how did my decision <coughs> optimize care for the patient that felt so much more empowering. And I felt, Oh, you know, she's really thinking about me if I was your patient right there. And I know you're always thinking about me knowing who you are and your dedication to patient care and that you created this practice in order to spend time with them and live within your value system. But when we're disempowered, you know, and this, this is always for women in particular, we've, you know, we've been oppressed and we lose confidence and then we show up and we're just so self doubt and so much anxiety, where if you truly know that you're living in alignment with your values and you can hold it, right. You stand up differently. You present yourself differently. Like people are going to judge us either way, right? If we're working the traditional hours, if we're doing or what not. we're like should do, or if we are created a life for ourselves, that's like truly a reflection of what we want to be doing. So if we can just own it 
and see how it impacts you. Like I just got the chills when you shifted because I could feel it. I could just feel the energy difference. Yeah. Yeah. It was slow. Um, and, um, there isn't somebody else who tells you this. So you have to arrive at it yourself. And so it's, uh, it's a process, but yes. So right. We have to give ourselves permission mm -hmm. <laughs> and nobody else is holding us back. Yes. Yeah. I love that permission. This channel used to be called permission to pivot because I had a hard time with career transitions. Now it's a life true to you. Really it's permission to live a life true to you. And, and you said fear, right? The fear of other people's opinions is something I talk about a lot because it's not necessarily like the patients are judging us. It's what we think they're thinking of us based off of like our own internal dialogue. And can you help us to understand like kind of what helped you with that shift of like, I'm really afraid of what other people are going to think. And like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do this for me. Right. So uh, I, uh, for me, the fear was um, a business fear. I didn't want the business to fail because I really, I uh, say that I'm either doing it this way or not at all. And uh, so that uh, was it. I did not want patients to stop coming or referral uh, sources to dry up for that reason. I had already decided um, that uh, I don't care what other people thought about my business model. In fact, my husband was not quite on board. Uh, he kept saying I was wasting time. He was like, why don't you do uh, what's, uh, you know, what is easy and what is done and stuff. Um, so he didn't, um, uh, so it, it was not that part for me. As to what helped with the shift, I think the evidence builds up gradually and that helps our confidence. I got a favorable uh, feedback from both patients and referrers so that uh, external validation certainly helps and uh, corroborates what I was beginning to uh, gradually realize that, hey, I'm doing everything that they do in a traditional setup. So, so, it's, uh, um, so it's fine. And when uh, a year or two uh, went by and uh, the practice filled up uh, some and I crunched the numbers, um, I was like, wow, this really works because I had worked earlier about the same and made about half as much. It was at that point that I realized maybe there is something to this and this is not just something I am doing as a privileged person, um, and, uh, you know, uh, just to while my time away or something and that maybe this could work for others as well. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is a sustainable model that allows us to take care of ourselves as well as our patients. Um, um, so those, uh, yeah, that's how it gradually um, it took, I would say, about two years or so, uh, so before I begin to realize these things. But mm. uh, yeah. And for people who are going to be thinking this, I'm putting my <clears> mindset <throat> on to the people who are considering shifting out of employed position and the questions that will most likely arise. You said to lean out, we're going to uh, consider our overhead when it comes to rent space. We're going to consider personnel who's required when you start. People are going to hear uh, you know, we think about DPC versus am I going to accept insurance or not? And this might change for you over time, but just to those people who are contemplating, you know, with the re re reimbursements changing and being uh, lower, are you ex currently still accepting insurance and how do, are you deciding like what kind of model that you want to continue to pursue? Right. So I'd say to anybody, if they have primary care uh, or if they uh, feel right about it, go DPC. There is no need to stick to the insurance system if you think you can make it work. Um, I thought long and hard about it um, because uh, the DPC model really uh, feels right. However, I could not justify to myself as a subspecialist um, how a patient is supposed to pay, say, even $100 a month for their primary care and for one specialist or the other specialist. Because as a nephrologist, I'll see patients with um, chronic kidney disease, and they also usually have a cardiologist on board. Um, it's metabolic disease, maybe an endocrinologist. Um, so all of these. So I, I, in my head, I was uh, wondering, and it did not quite sit right with me, which is why I started with the insurance model. And, and I still am an insurance model. There is no cash pay uh, component or membership component to it at all. I do not know if I will pivot in the future. But for the time being, I think it's okay. Because again, if you keep things lean, uh, even if you uh, make less, just because you're spending less, it feels all right. Uh, I'm bringing home an, an amount for the amount I work, um, uh, which I am perfectly uh, happy with. And it, it, goes, it goes to show, uh, and 
knowing billing and knowing coding appropriate. I had uh, Dr. John Lynn on the channel. He had, he's a urologist that has a private practice. He helps educate other urologists on making sure you're coding appropriately and mm -hmm. uh, with integrity, but just knowing that, you know, when it comes to auditing and, um, and making sure that your coding reflects the work that you put into it. Well, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but in, in my residency, we did kind of have to know a little bit about billing because we would circle the codes and things like that. And then we had somebody that would audit our nodes and make sure we were coding appropriately. That's not offered very often. It is not. I never had that privilege during training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And things change. So you got to be up, you know, and know it. And, right. Right. And to make it like, okay, well, if you, if you can make it related to your why, right. So it's not so mentally like, oh, I don't want to right? It's like, like you said, it's like, I want this to succeed and here's the why, and I'm going to tie that why, and we can mentally play some games with ourselves in order to make it more desirable to learn these things where people that love to learn. And um, one other thing, thinking about questions that might come up is how do you market yourself? Right. So um, the marketing is lo all local because, you know, the, this is a brick and mortar practice. Uh, so uh, as a subspecialist, the centers of influence are other referring physicians. Um, so I uh, pounded the pavement, um, went and told everybody, hi, uh, this is who I am. Um, mm -hmm. And this is what I do. These are the most common conditions I see. And I can get patients in within the week. The eyebrows shot up, really, because the wait time is in months uh, for my specialty in my neck of the mm -hmm. woods. Um, so that really helped bring in the first few patients. Uh, once they'd sent a few patients and saw mm, my work, I am really grateful that uh, many of them um, have continued um, to support. Um, some patients will come through insurance uh, networks or directories, but that is a small, small amount. Within the last year, I have had more and more patients come and self-referred. Uh, from reading reviews and stuff. Um, so in terms of marketing, um, yes, so find your centers of influence. Uh, if you're primary care, then uh, it's going to be other stuff, right? You're going to have to do some social media marketing, basically reach um, the con consumer or the patient directly, maybe ERs and urgent cares, drop off your cards, take some goodies. Um, but um, <clears throat> other than that, uh, your, your own patients by word of mouth uh, of more uh, newer patients. Yeah, I think those were some of, and reviews. I was not asking patients for reviews in at the visit. I still feel a little um, uh, hesitant about that. Um, I just say thank you when they say something nice. But we have a process where at the end of the day, my VA, uh, my virtual assistant, sends out a pre-made template to every patient seen that day um, for a review. Um, so um, uh, that way, even if we've seen them 10 times before, if they have not reviewed us yet, uh, we just send them the message because, uh, you know, maybe it's the 10th time that the patient is like, fine, they really want to review. Let's just give it to them. I do have a system um, at the end of the day. I will tell her if there is a patient or two that I'm getting a vibe for whatever reason, you know, that um, it may not be a great review. Then no, we don't send it to them. Everybody else after every visit unless they have already uh, reviewed us, uh, get sent a request for review. Um, so this is what helped me get to more than 100 uh, five-star reviews. And so right now I'm at the top of the page if you Google my specialty for my town, and that brings in more patients. Yeah, so you lowered the resistance by automating the, auto, automating the process and delegating the task that you're like, oh, I, I just self-promotion and like asking for reviews. And then you're mindful that reviews are a reflection on what's going on for the patient. So if that patient is having a lot of issues and that review is likely not going to be a reflection on your care. So like people were here this like, oh, she's cherry picking reviews. Well, let's consider she is appropriately being mindful of whose review might not actually reflect the services provided for whatever reason, whatever they had going on. And then for physicians to, you know, when it comes to reading our reviews, like it can be so damaging to our, you know, hearts when we get a review that, you know, you put in so much effort, right? And a lot of us have this never enough feeling sometimes and like, oh gosh, we've been really trained for these um, subjective feedback to matter. So just remember, I've heard you say this on the Lean Out podcast too, and I really appreciate it. So thank you to, let's see, Don Baker, Dr. Don Baker for interviewing you on her Lean Up podcast. I'm going to share that episode in, in the description below too. It was a really great episode. But it was something that you also reiterated in that 
podcast, I think it's so important for us to know is that anybody's feedback to us is going to be a reflection on what's going on for them. And then whatever comes up for us helps us to pinpoint, Ooh, where were we insecure? What's this bringing up? It's an opportunity for self-awareness, for self-reflection, and then to take a breath and say, okay, what aspects, if any, are these, is this feedback accurate? Do I want to work on? And what aspects is like, maybe that was a projection of something else. And I'm just going to, you know, let it, what, what would you do if, if you got a review that just didn't seem to reflect the care that you provided? All of it, um, ex- uh, exactly as you said. You know, we know, especially in the coaching world where you belong, um, that uh, when someone says something, um, it, it generally in our personal lives, that is their thoughts that led to their words and actions. Why don't we uh, realize that reviews are just words in the written format? And so, of course, it is going to reflect uh, what a patient, uh, where the patient is coming from. And I have so many examples of this um, in uh, my practice with my own reviews. I remember a patient, one of the five-star reviews is from a patient that I, I was running late that day. And I don't usually run late because I don't overbook. Um, I um, Even 10, 15 minutes is fairly unusual for me. But, uh, for some reason, a patient came in late and therefore um, I saw this patient late. And yet when he was being seen, he gave, uh, he conveyed a message to me for my virtual assistant saying, hey, let her know she was great on the phone. Um, And uh, when he got the review request, he, uh, you know, he not only just gave gave the five stars, but also wrote kind words. So that was not me. uh, I was being myself and did for him what I do for uh, everybody else. It was him. On the other hand, my only one star review, oh, let me not jinx myself. Um, uh, he was a patient. No, no. <laughs> um, he came in an hour late and I was getting ready to leave. It was the end of the day. And I saw him in the waiting room and I, I was so taken aback, but I was like, you know what? Um, I thought you were not coming in today, but let me see you because I'm still here. And um, so I went back to the room and took care of him. And because I probably mentioned that please be on time because we run on time here. And uh, and I told him that I was able to see you only because it was the end of the day and there was nobody else waiting. Um, otherwise, I may not be able to take care of you and I would hate that for you. Um, he gave me a one-star review. So it's like... <laughs> no. So, so it's so, so important to always remember this. I think the oh, I'm so part... frustrated. Like, honestly, <laughs> a patient who could have been so appreciative. Oh, thank you. I'm an hour late and you took the time to see me five stars. Like that just gives me a stress headache to, to know that you stayed longer to care for this patient. And, you know, it's often individuals who feel entitled or like when they show up late, like that's a demonstration of respect, you know, unless it's you know, sometimes, oftentimes, but, or maybe they're used to the medical model. and like, well, my doctor is usually an hour late. So I'm going right. to have appointments exactly. that I'm on time, right? There's multiple exactly. reasons they had urgency, exactly. right? But if people are chronically late, right? Like chronically late and they just to consider <laughs> that that's the one let that me make you f- <laughs> yeah let me make you feel better about your headache so i was obviously bummed about it um uh, when it came in and uh, i was sharing this with uh, my 13 year old who went don't uh, don't sweat it uh, it makes your business look more real um mm-hmm. how can a business have all five stars and maybe one or two four stars uh, you know so uh, I that made me feel so good. I was like, wow, wise one. Thank you. So yes, I didn't give it another thought. And, oh uh, my yeah. gosh. <laughs> That's, isn't that interesting? And then, you know, uh, in the celebrity world, it's kind of like no attention is bad attention kind of thing, but um, it's not always the same, especially if people are getting their um, salaries are dependent on these patient reviews. That Yes. But yes. I like that mindset. It's really interesting. I'll tell a quick story is I went to an orthodontist for a workup. I had braces last year. So I I didn't go to this orthodontist. It was, you know, I'm training in dentistry. I know know what to look out for. And this person sold me this extravagant plan that included surgery when I needed like minor shifts in my teeth. 
And just, he knew my background. He knew that I would understand what he was saying and question it. And I started neural surgery. So like, I I'm aware of the surgery that he said, I'm like, I'm not like, that's not, a, I do not need that. It's like $20,000 plan. I'm like, that was atrocious. That was low integrity. This guy, just his presence was just so cavalier and like, or like, uh, just not a personality type that I usually love to be around. And the next day I got an email for a review. And if you give a five-star review, you get a, a $5 Starbucks card. And the people that cater to, he caters to are right. Usually younger who like five star, you know, when you're in high school, you're in middle school, you're like, Whoa, yes. And so he's got all these five-star reviews, which include patients that never actually had treatment that like literally say it. How, do I send this to the board and just like, like, let them know these are all fabricated. And I had, you know, and I was like, okay, well, he's probably going to retaliate. I have all these like pros and cons of just, you know, I didn't end up reporting him, but I am just saying it now because that was, you just never know what goes into these five-star mm-hmm. reviews. So the fact that you had, you know, that one star, it does make sense. And the fact that you have the practice that you did, it didn't impact you in the way that it could have, if someone's salary is, which is ridiculous. Cause we know there's survey biases, but I don't want to stress right. people out because they're like, oh no, it really matters to me because it impacts right. my revenue. And right. I think that's the wrong part of all of this, that it has been weaponized. Um, it is it is anything but an objective measure. So yes, um, to have salaries dependent on it is um yeah, that's just outrageous. Um, you know, otherwise I think nobody would get as stressed about reviews as we do as a group. Uh it's only uh, because it really matters um that way. Um yeah, that and that's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it still impacts us emotionally if we're not just allowing ourselves that space to reflect on what we captured. It's not a reflection of you. Most of the time, it's something that was out of your control. And if there are places where you can learn and grow from that feedback, just take, take what aspects are growth opportunities and we'll let ourselves free from the rest. And now tell us where you're at now. You're helping of course, people to realize this is possible. What else are you up to now? I began to talk about this, um, uh, like I said, uh, maybe about a year, year and a half back when I realized that maybe it uh, would work. And I uh, pivoted the blog. You, uh, you alluded to the uh, personal finance blog. Yes. So I, as I was like, you know, this is pretty much what I'm thinking 99.9% of the time. And there are other people doing good work on the personal finance side. So I rebranded the blog as a lean private practice solutions and write mostly about that. As uh, there as well as in my Facebook group of the same name, there's this idea that had, I had been toying about for a while since I since the time I started. That was regarding space. Like I said, uh, office space is one of the biggest expenses for any practice. And when I was beginning, I wanted to ideally sublet space from um, a, a, another established practice in uh, my area. And I just couldn't find anything. I cold called a few practices and. Um, uh, they were also surprised and uh, so yeah I couldn't find anything that way and that's how I ended up with the shared workspace uh, location so I always uh, since then I was wondering if there was a way we could you know make this more um, reachable to more people like hey there's space here um, and so I created this online platform called linkmedicalspaces.com which is really an online platform where if you are a practice owner or uh, uh, an investor and have Uh, medical office space available, whether it's the entire suite or even a part of it, or whether it's available full-time or part-time, and you um, uh, um, then you can list it on there for those who are looking for sub leasing options. Of course, you could you could uh, post it on there for uh, primary leases as well. But um, the primary reason I started it uh, was uh, for sub lease options because I don't think that exists on any other platform. Like the commercial real estate sites, like LoopNet and stuff, will let you. Lease an empty, empty office space, but not subleasing options. Mm-hmm. And also, um, if it's a smaller area, it gets kind of hidden in the thousands of listings of a regular commercial uh, real estate um, site. This is uh, healthcare specific, so it is directly targeting your um, uh, your uh, audience that you're looking for. Um, and there are no real estate f- commissions or anything to consider, um, so it's uh, really, really low cost in comparison. I learned while I was uh, researching and working on this that. Uh, realtor commissions uh, for uh, leasing out your space is a certain percentage of the entire lease term. So uh, if the lease term is 10 years, 
you're going to pay that commission over 10 years. Mm. So that uh, amounts to tens of thousands of dollars, probably. Uh, we recently launched a feature on the um, uh, site. Uh, if you're looking for space, um, then uh, also you can um, list it. Um, that's a separate page and that is completely free of cost. Um, so like, hey, I'm a DPC practice. Um, I'm looking for space to sublease to start out. Uh, so it's perfect for those who are either starting out or want to keep working part time or keep it small for, uh, for any reason. Um, or if you're an established practice and looking to start a satellite location in another uh, place, then again, this is perfect to test the waters um, and keep things lean in the beginning, figure out how things go and take it from there. And sublease uh, leases are also um, shorter term. Um, when I was looking for space, <laughs> I realized in a jiffy it was going to be undoable. It was like, uh, yeah, five thousand dollars a month for ten years. I was like, all right, thank you. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, uh, these. Um, so hopefully, uh, it uh, will uh, be of value to both sides. Established practices. One, you are utilizing a resource you have. You have these five thousand square foot. You're using utilizing four thousand of it well. But the last two rooms, uh, the end of the hallway, are sitting fallow, full of boxes. Clean them out. Uh, make them into exam rooms and uh, you know have somebody else utilize them uh, it will be a passive revenue stream um, also you're reducing waste um, and you're helping somebody out in need a, a colleague um, and you're bringing in value for your own patients because um, you can bring in a service uh, that you do not provide but it's complementary to you, uh, what you do so if you are primary care bring in um, a nutritionist uh, a physical therapist um, a mental health professional um, uh, there are so many ways uh, to go about this. Um, if you're a pediatrician, um, uh, speech and language pathologist, it's a win-win. Uh, yeah, we just launched that a few months back. Happy to answer any questions about it. Yeah. yeah, I had an internist in Chapel Hill who shared space with a psychiatrist and dietitian because she catered to individuals who would need that support from eating disorder standpoint. Right. And it was so helpful, not only right. for her business model, but for the patient care standpoint. And, you know, when we think about people are being, uh, having this learned helplessness and like, oh my gosh, things are getting worse. We just talked about reimbursements getting worse. And what you showcased here was how we change medicine. The person that you are, you, you've created this for you. And now you don't have to be an, you don't have to share this information with others, but you are, you didn't have to create this link medical, right? But you are. So you're showcasing how we can form together, create medicine in a way that aligns with your values and be the change. You are the change agent. That was appropriate when you put that in your bio. Like you're just showcasing the change agent and the heart and the passion that you have to give this gift to others. What motivates you? Thank you so much for the kind words. This is what keeps me going. Um, uh, 100% agree with you. We are the vanguard of change. No one on the outside is coming to save us. I don't think anybody else is feeling pitiful about doctors. So now we realize the problems within, not uh, not only for our patients, so and also uh, but also for ourselves. Um, and uh, and we are a bunch of smart, resourceful people. I mean, uh, when co confronted with a problem, yeah, you can get us down for a little bit, but we're not going to stay there. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to find our way out. So yeah, I think. Um, Tiny changes are how it's going to begin before we can affect the big systemic changes. And those need to come too. Um, but I guess the grassroots level is where it starts always. Um, and yeah, I'd encourage anybody, you know, who wants um, to do anything different. Um, failure is okay. Um, especially in the business or entrepreneurial side, this is not medicine, no life is at stake. Um, you just pivot um, if you need to pivot um, or you would have found the next great thing. Um, so uh, yeah, it's important for us to remember we're held back by our own A pluses uh, mm -hmm. throughout our careers. Yeah. The meaning that we make of that, right? Because mm -hmm. Sarah Blakely, the Spanx creator, mm -hmm. her father used to ask, what did you fail at today? Right. And if we've had this identity where we're perfectionistic and we see failure as a threat to our identity, we're going to have resistance, resistance to lean into these things at the compromise of a life. It holds us back, like at the compromise of a life that's truly in alignment with what we want and with increased internal suffering. I knew when I kind of let changed my mind about that, it was we have so much suffering in the world and we're adding to our internal suffering with all of the self criticism. And we normalized, oh, we're our own worst critic, blah, blah, blah. Well, 
I've learned over the years, you can also be your own best friend, right? To trust that you have your own back and find a community like Mitra has created so that you're not stepping out on alone, right? You're not doing this alone. She just showcased to you some resources, some support, right? You are not doing this alone. And the word courage really comes to my mind because you said your spouse wasn't even on board. You did it anyways. So for the people who would really value from this one, you know, you said small steps. So maybe a small step is to just have the courage to consider it. What message would you give for them today? Remember who you are. Um, you know, I absolutely hate when someone says, I'm just a doctor. Just a doctor or physician cannot come in the same line. It's just not allowed. You got this. Yeah, baby steps. Uh, what is the next best thing you can do today to make something, even a tiny thing better and take it from there? Next best step you can take today, small changes over time, create sustainable results and also allow you to pivot before you've gone too far in a direction that maybe you don't want to be in. Mitra, you shared so much wisdom. And for the people, of course, if you have questions, comments, I'd love to have you back on if people are putting some questions below so that we can continue this conversation. But for the people who want to get in touch directly with you, can you share what's the best way to do that? Absolutely. So I'm all over Facebook. I spend way too much time there. I'm on my, and uh, with my name, uh, Sangamitra, <laughs> Sangamitra Sadhu. Um, and uh, my group there is Lean Private Practice Solutions. My email is hello at linkmedicalspaces.com. Uh, feel free, um, easy to reach. Awesome. I'm going to have all those links down in the description below. Mitra, thank you so much for joining me today. This was an absolute blast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Keep up the great work. <laughs> I want to hear about these next steps that everyone's taking, even if that next step is to pause and to audit your life and say, do I want to make a change? And what could life look like if I had the courage to live a life true to myself?